Hello, friends, and welcome to the Wisdom for Life broadcast. This is Pastor Glenn with another episode that we hope will bless you. Well, it's 2020, right? Hey, man, what a trip. 2020, did you ever think you'd make it this far? I didn't either. I didn't either. You talk about 2020, you talk about vision. And, uh, you know, the Bible says without vision, the people perish, right? I'd love to know more of what uh, the Lord Jesus Christ has envisioned for my life and for this church. And, and, and to do that, all we need to do is simply ask. Isn't that what the Bible says in James? It says, if anyone lack wisdom, let him call upon the Lord who giveth liberally. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't pick certain people to give it to. He says, I'll give it to anybody that asks. And I know that God uh, wants to do some amazing things in your life this year and in my life as well and in this church corporately. But I want to focus on prayer for the entirety of January, part of February. So we're going to be closing our services by asking the Lord to bless and touch the people around us. So listen, do, do yourself, do your church, do me a big favor. Um, when we close in prayer today, don't leave. Please don't leave. Listen, I'll get, you in t- I'll, I'll get you out to lunch before the Baptist. I promise. You, it'll be okay. Just take a few moments and pray with someone. And then go. And just see how that begins to change things. Not only in your life, but also in, in, in the life of your church. Amen? Awesome, awesome. Three amens, that's good. So turn in your Bible to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1. And we're going to be talking about how to pray a breakthrough in our lives, in each other's lives, how we can pray a breakthrough in our lives. And there's some principles here, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 1. And I'm going to do this uh, a little bit differently this morning. The Lord's kind of led me to uh, do a little bit of an expository on this text. So we're going to be reading the text, and then then we're going to be talking about it a little bit, and then going back to the text. So if you just want to stay there, um, we'll go through the text. It's a great story about how God brings about breakthrough. Through prayer. How many of you need something from the Lord this morning? Yeah, yeah me too. I'm good, I'm not alone. The shocking truth that I want to leave you with today, if you don't get anything else before you go home, I want you to get this. That when you receive things from the Lord, trying isn't always the answer. In fact, sometimes trying is a trap. You know, I used to hear that when I, you know, I'd hear that from my parents. I'd hear that when i go to school. school, you know, hey, just try more. Just try more. Sometimes try more is a trap. Just try. Just try more. You won't find try more in the Bible. But you will find trust. And sometimes we want to do... Yeah, how many of you know we've got an American attitude? I know that I do. If it's to be, it's up to me. You know, we're independent, man. We want to get out there and get it done, especially if you're a dude. Now, dudettes, you're not this way, but dudes are this way. Come on. Four dudes. Great. It's a great service this morning already. We're guys, we think, man, we got to get out there and do it. But but I want to tell you, sometimes that's a trap. I'm not not letting you off the hook this morning. Yeah, yeah, you got to put feet on your prayers. Faith, uh, you know, faith shows up in our works. James argues that. But, but but, But tell Abraham to try harder, and he'll say, no, 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 no. Trust is the answer. What did Abraham do when he tried harder? God told him, you're going to be the father of many nations, right? And he said, oh, yeah, right, I'm about 75 already. Took 25 years to get Isaac. He had to trust for 25 years. But right out of the gate, he said, well, maybe I can help God, right? And his wife, Sarah, came to him and said, hey, Hagar, my maidservant, try harder. Come on. And Abraham went, pew. And we got Ishmael, right? And we got rockets flying now. Come on. You know what I'm talking about. That's what try harder got us into. Trust is the way. Trust is the way. Sometimes activity doesn't necessarily equate to accomplishment. You're just spinning your wheels. You're stuck in one place and you're giving it more gas. I want to give you a quick story. We'll dive right into this text in a minute. But I, I want to make sure that you understand where I'm headed with this not try harder. When my, when my daughter first got her, uh, her driver's license, uh, my oldest, Caitlin, uh, 
over in Japan right now. When she first got her driver's license, we went out and got her a car, and that was really scary. It was scary. You've been there. Uh, the kids went over to somebody's house one night, and, and, and Caitlin went over there to pick them up, and it had rained really hard that day. And this is in southern Illinois, so anything in southern Illinois that's low is full of water and mud. Okay, that's just the way it is in, in that part of America. But anyway, she, she got her car stuck. So she calls home. She says, Dad, I can't get out. I said, okay, I'll be right there. I, I, I go over to the house, and uh, I see her just, rrr, rrr, and it's just throwing water everywhere, throwing mud everywhere. Well, I brought some boards with me. Come on. Some of you guys know what I'm going to do, right? Well, I said, honey, now, now don't just lay off the gas. You know, don't give it any gas. Let dad get these, <laughs> let dad put these, put these boards down first. And I'm telling her this, the door's open. She's like, okay, dad, okay, yeah, okay. Well, I get down there, and I'm like, now don't give it any gas. And my mouth's wide open, and she hits the gas. All this, all this mud and water comes up into my mouth. The most disgusting moment of my life, I'm covered in, like, mud and dirt. How many of you know that's love? <laughs> you look up love in the dictionary, and it's a father covered in mud telling his daughter, don't give it any more gas. <laughs> Sometimes God, the Father, is telling you, just sit and trust me. Amen. You're spinning your wheels. You're just throwing mud. You're making a mess of it. Will you let me? Hey, the battle belongs to the Lord. Trust me. Just stay there and trust me. <laughs> I think you're with me now. All right, okay. Let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1. It's a story of Jehoshaphat. Now, if you're old enough, you used to say, jumping Jehoshaphat. Right? Who in the world even knows what that means? Nobody has a clue. I looked it up, I googled it, still couldn't figure it out. Maybe somebody email me later. But Jehoshaphat means simply this. In Hebrew, it means God has, past tense, God has judged. Already, not will, has. And you know, when I start to think about past tense, I start to think about how to pray and how faith works. Think about this for a moment. Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, verse 24, anytime you ask for anything in prayer, watch the past tense here. Believe that you have received, E-D, received. Believe that you have received it. That's past tense. Then he goes into future tense. And you will receive it. What are you telling me, Pastor, this morning? i got to believe for something that I don't already see so that I can have what I don't already got? Yep, that's called faith. That's how it works. It messes up your mind. You say, well, then how do I do it? With your heart, with faith. It's counterintuitive. But it's past tense. God has already judged your situation. Already. He's already paid for it. He's already provided for it. The propitiation of the cross is the payment for whatever you're going through. So it's just a matter of trust and time. Amen? Come on, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. All right. It says this, verse 1. After this, after what? They had a big spiritual revival. The nation of Judah was kicking it, man. They were cool with God. Things were happening. Three enemies come together, they're going to gang up on Judah and Jehoshaphat, and they are, they are coming to, to clean his clock. They're coming to cream this guy and his nation. It says, after this, after this long revival, three enemy nations attack, are united to attack King Jehoshaphat. And spies told him, a huge combined army is marching towards Jerusalem right now to defeat you. Now, now how many of you know that'd be overwhelming? I, I want you to imagine, like, on the playground, you, 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 did, you remember you were on the playground at one point in your life. And I'm, I want you to imagine three big dudes the size of Mike Headley. And recess, it's recess. you got ten minutes for recess. And how many of you know when three dudes step up on you like Mike Headley, ten minutes is way too long. That's, that's way too long. A lot can happen in ten minutes when, when three of them combine together. How many of you know this is a situation that you can't fix by more activity? 
God is going to call you. He's going to prepare you to stand in places that are bigger than you. I've taught you before, you're not going to find in the Bible that God only gives you what you can handle. It's not biblical. God is always putting you in situations, listen, that are bigger than what you can handle so that he can show up and be God. And and, and so that's why it's happening. God wants to show his power. And and so what he's up against is bigger than him, Jehoshaphat. And and there's some principles here. I I want you to get them, okay? It says this. Scared and worried, King Jehoshaphat resolved to seek the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, that's what we're going to do the next 30 to 40 days. We're going to resolve to seek the Lord together as a church. All right? What else does he do? Does he, do? He's, he announces a nationwide fast so that everybody came together. They would fast and they would pray. They would seek help from God. And when they all got to the temple in Jerusalem, the king stood up and prayed aloud. Let's do that right now. Let's pray aloud. Father, in the name of Jesus. We trust you now to speak to your church and fill us with power to proclaim victory in Finley. The enemy is defeated in Jesus' name. Come on, strong amen. 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 Let's look at the principles here. First thing he does is he, he resolves to seek the Lord. That's a private matter. That's, that's, that's something you need to do on your own. And the next thing he does is he says, hey, you know what else? I need to get with some other people and seek the Lord. And then when he gets with those other people, they all seek the Lord together. I don't know, this sounds like the upper room to me. I don't know, this kind of sounds like how God does things. When you decide to pray, and you decide to pray with other people, and you begin to agree together. How many of you know the Bible says whatever is agreed upon on earth will be done in heaven? Woo, that's power, man. That's power. That's good. And and that's what he does. He says, you know what? I'm going to seek God. He doesn't seek a lawyer. He doesn't seek seek, uh, somebody to help him out with some counseling, some financial counseling. Come on, how many of you know he doesn't seek a bankruptcy attorney? He doesn't get on social media. Please, please, please. The first person you seek shouldn't be people. Hey, I'm going to let you in on something. It's a secret, though. Ready for this? Most people don't even care. He does. But why are we going to people? Why are we going to people before God? The first person you ought to talk to when you're in a crisis is Christ. Amen. Man, I mean, God can get more done in five minutes of your prayer closet than three days of being on social media. Well, maybe some people feel sorry for me. Hey, that's where that's coming from, man. Right? Look, you don't need somebody to feel sorry for you. You need the Spirit. You need power. So that's what he does. He he seeks the Lord. There's an example of this because he not only seeks the Lord, he seeks to get people to pray together. Think about Job's life. Here's a great example in Scripture of how prayer works. In Job's life, how many of you know that Job was a great and wealthy guy? Right? And then uh, then everything broke loose, man, in, in, in his life. And there was war, spiritual warfare in his life. And, and Job had lost, it, lost almost all of it. Everything, his family, his house, his cattle, everything. He's, got, he's covered in boils. Then he gets these friends that show up. Come on. And they get it all wrong, don't they? So, but that's what we do. We say, I'll, I'll call up three or four people, and I'll tell them my problems, and, and then maybe it'll get better. Does it get better for Job? No. But I want to give you a secret. The very last chapter of Job everything turns around and he gets double for his trouble do you know what gets him there the Bible says that God tells him to pray for his friends go home and read it it's in the last chapter of Job and the moment he prays for his friends God gives him double back have you ever looked at prayer that way 
Have you ever looked at when you're at your worst, God wants you to minister the most? That's, that's crazy thinking. But it's true. When you're at your lowest, God is at his highest in the power that he wants to show through your life. So he could have said, God, look, why am I going to pray for these guys? They haven't lost their house. They haven't lost their family. They haven't lost their, their sheep. And God says, hey, go pray for him. And when he does, he's blessed. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good right there. That's what happens. Look at 2 Chronicles 20, verse 3. It says, King Jehoshaphat, he feared and resolved to seek the Lord. He sought Christ. He didn't magnify the crisis. He resolved to seek the Lord. You know, when you come to the Lord, please, let me help you out in your prayer life. When you come to the Lord, you don't want to tell the Lord about your crisis. He already knows that. Amen. He already knows what, Amen. he already knows that. You, 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 you want to magnify him, not the problem. You, you, you want to give God center stage. And so when you pray, you, God already knows what you're going through. What God wants to hear is, do you trust him? Do you trust him? Are you going to lift him up? How do you do that? Let me give you a few pointers from scripture. Uh, first is this, okay? Remind yourself of the greatness of God. Remind yourself of the greatness of God. You see, the bigger that God is in your mind and in your life, the smaller the problem gets. And that's, that's, a, that's good. That's good. Look at verse 6. Here's what he prayed. Oh, Lord, are you not the God who's in heaven? You rule over every kingdom and every nation. You are so powerful and mighty that nothing and no one can defeat you. That's how he starts the prayer. He doesn't start the prayer talking about how big the enemy is or how, how there's, there's three Ryan Headleys coming after him. Right? <laughs> I switched. He's a pretty big guy, too. He's taller than me. So he says, Lord, I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to focus on the size of my God. And that's exactly what he does. And then the next thing, realize his unlimited power. Say unlimited. Unlimited, he, unlimited power. Look at this. In, look at this. In, in verse 7, it says, God, did you not drive out those who tried to keep us from living here? When you brought us back home, what's he talking about? He's talking about the Exodus. He's saying, when we came out of Egypt, didn't you drive, when you brought us through the sea, didn't you drive the enemy back? What we thought was an obstacle was actually the power of our salvation. That, that sea in front of us uh, was only there for the enemy. It wasn't there to stop us. It was there to destroy what was after us. And God, did, isn't that who you are? This is how he prays. It, I tell you, we don't pray this way. And then remind God of his promises. Oh, I want to show you here. In the next verse, he says, God, look at this. God, by the way, did you not give the promised land to your friend Abraham, his descendants? Hey, by the way, that's us. That's us. To be theirs forever. So he's saying, God, you promised. God, you promised. Did you know that God loves to be reminded of his promises? Yes. Can, I, can, I, can I teach why? Have you ever thought about why? It's not that he forgets. It, he's not like dad here. You ever made a promise to your kids? You ever put your kids in a corner and forget they're there? Yeah. That's me. That's what I did. My kids would yell from the other side of the house. They'd say, Mom, can you tell dad we've been here three hours? You ever, you ever make a promise to your, to your kids? That you'll do something, and then your kids come back and remind you, and you're like, oh, man. No, I know, you're all so good. You're, you've been such great, great spiritual parents and grandparents. Tell your kids you're going to go swimming, right? We even get a hotel. We're going to go swimming in that pool. And then you're tired. Your kid's jumping up and down on the bed. Come on, take us to the pool. You're like, ah, you promised. You're like, kid, okay. We're like that. God's not like that. Why does God want to be reminded of his promises? Watch this. Because his promises are his word. He loves his word. So he loves his promises. But I'm not stopping there. His word is his son. He loves his son. 
He loves His Son. Have you ever looked at Jesus Christ as the fullness of the promises of the Father? So every time you remind God of His promise, you remind Him of His Word. And every time you remind Him of His Word, you remind Him of His Son. He sees His Son. And He goes, wow, I love Him. That's why we remind Him of His promises. You say, I don't even know if that's scriptural. Look at this, Isaiah 62, 6. Put the Lord in remembrance of His promises. Again, it's not that He forgets. It's that He loves to see His Son. All right? Keep not silent. So Isaiah says, hey, God's made you some promises. Remind God of His Son and His Word. He loves His Son and His Word, and He wants to bless you. Hallelujah, amen. Man, that ought to give you a goosebump. If you don't have goosebumps yet, I'm going to be checking you for a pulse. Come on. So look at, in the, next, in the next verse, now we pray for a breakthrough. See, after all of that, now we, we tell God what we really need. Look, look at this. It's in verse 10. Our enemies want to destroy us. Will you not stop them from defeating us? Now, he's very specific here. He's not general. I want, to, I want to teach you this morning. When you pray and you ask God for something, be very specific. If you generalize it, you won't know when the answer comes. Think about that. And you need the answer to come, and you need to know when it comes so that you can give Him more praise. So, so you need to know when the answer comes, so be very, very specific. I'm not kidding you. When, when, when I was getting ready to get me a lady, come on, Barry White's playing right now. I made a list as a kid. I, I was, I was just, just saved, filled with the Holy Spirit. And I, I made a list. I said, Lord, on one side of the list, I said, I, I need somebody that can, can go with me in ministry. I need somebody that's smart and beautiful and funny. I need somebody that uh, can, can handle me. You know? And I made a list. You think I'm joking? I did. And when I met my wife, I was like, yep, 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 yep. Okay, you're it. <laughs> it's like tag you're it you know and it chased me for 31 years but but uh but on the other side of that list i had to be all i had to become all these people you got to do a work in me god so that so that i'm ready for that but what did i do i just trusted him i didn't go i didn't go running around chasing people and hey where was where was adam when god made eve At, boy that that sounds pretty cool that's what I'm famous for. Right? Some of you are famous for doing it while I preach. God bless you. I love you. Maybe that's what you're doing. <laughs> God changed my wife. Adam was just loving on Jesus, loving on the Father. And the Father came along and reached inside his side while he was asleep you know i've learned not too long ago that you know what resting in his promises is the greatest activity i could ever do yes. boy that is that has saved you a lot of knocking your head up against the wall just resting in his promises stay put and trust him and god will work it out he says god you know what i'm going to be very specific Here's my request. God, I, I, these enemies are coming. And, and, and I'm not enough. I can, I, I'm powerless against them. Have you ever felt powerless? Just have a kid. Some of you are a kid's on the way. God bless you, man. You, you, hold a, you hold a crying baby. And you just don't, I mean, you just love them. But sometimes you just, what do I do? How many of you have been? I've been there as a guy. I'm like, Sarah, don't leave. So I don't know. What, 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 you feel powerless. Listen, you, in ministry, this is why people don't sign up and line up for ministry. Because you feel powerless. Come on. There, there's over 100 people in a congregation or more. How in the world am I going to be and what, I, what they need and how do I do this, God? And then you just get to the place to where you realize, you realize, I can't. I can't, but he can. 
So, so, so you get to the end of your rope, and being at the end of your rope is the greatest place to be. Because when you run out of strength, his strength kicks in. He's not looking to mix his strength with yours. When you, when you admit that this is bigger than me, and you say, God, I give up, God says, great, now we can get started. Now we can get, now my power can be revealed. Isn't it shown in weakness? Yeah, that's what Paul argued. So look, he's, he feels powerless. Look at 2 Chronicles 10, 12. We are powerless against this mighty army that is coming to attack us. We don't know what to do, but we're looking to you for help. God, give us help. Do you notice that six verses earlier? It's really interesting. In verse 12, it says here, we're powerless. But six verses earlier, he says, you're all powerful. You know, I don't have to be all things. God is. I don't have to have all power. He's omnipotent. I don't have to be everywhere. He's omnipresent. All I got to do is know him. That is, that's easy. But it's kind of like a, it's kind of like Chinese handcuffs. Right? You, 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 you keep pulling this way and you're stuck. And the only thing you can do is just let go. And that's when God kicks in. Sometimes it means just stopping and it, it, right where you're at and, and trusting God instead of trying. I want you to think about Ephesians 6 when, when Paul talks about the armor of God. Think about that for a minute. He, he begins it not with, and listen, I, I love movies like Gladiator, right? Russell Crowe, man, he's a big dude. He's a bad dude. I like movies like that. I know you don't because you're a Christian, but I, I like movies where like armies come in and they're like, you know, let's, let's charge the enemy. But, but that's not what Ephesians 6 says. It says when you've done all to stand, comma, stand. You're, so you get equipped with this armor of God to stand there. And we think, well, now that I got all this, this armor, I need to go, I need to go running after something. You know, run off, R-U-N-N-O-F-T. No, you just stand there. When you've done all to stand, stand. And then, then, then Paul starts talking about how God equips you with that armor. Isn't that cool? All you got to do is just stay put, grow where you're planted. Don't move. But man, I want to run. I want to run. He not only stands, but in verse 13... It says this, all the men of Judah stood before the Lord. And then watch the next verse. Then all the men of Judah stood before the Lord, waiting with their wives and their young children and even their babies. Even their babies. Everybody stood together as this enemy's coming. Is that what you're... Man, George Patton would have a problem with this strategy. He would. Yeah, an enemy's coming and you're just standing there. Kind of like my wife says to me sometimes. You know, we got a problem. Don't just stand there, right? The garbage needs to be taken out. Don't just stand there. But that's what they do. That's what they do. Even with the babies. And they all stand there together and they trust God. And that's how this miracle begins to happen. And I want you to see, next thing is what God says. He, God starts to speak. And I, I, want you to t- I want to tell you something. In prayer, there needs to be a moment where you do the first principles that I taught you, and then there needs to be a moment where you eat a bowl of shut-it stew. Do you know what a bowl of shut-it stew is? Do you, do you know what it is? It means quiet. Be very, very Quiet quiet you ever go to you ever go to lunch with someone and it's a monologue it's like you don't you ever sit down with a friend and they got a motor mouth it's not a conversation right i mean they talk the whole time and you just say to yourself man would you take a breath because i got a few thoughts and on top of that your cheeseburger's all over me now you ever think about that This is not a conversation. You're the only one doing the talking. Have you ever thought about this for a minute? God might want to say something. Have you ever thought about in prayer, God might want to speak? 
And then we got to be still before the Lord to do that, man. You, we got to be quiet. And, and when they're quiet, God starts speaking. Look, look at these verses. I'm going to read them together. We're almost done. Stay with me. Look at verse 15 to, to 18. It says, this is what the Lord says to do. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. Okay, that's a good start. Just take up your position and stand. But stand strong. Then he goes on to say later, then just wait and watch and you will see the Lord deliver you. Okay, so you're not going to deliver yourself. God's going to deliver you. And this is the breakthrough prayer. Watch, here's what God says. Again, don't be afraid or discouraged. Don't be afraid or discouraged because the Lord is with you. Then the king and everyone else bowed down on the ground and they worshiped God. And this is what I want to, we're going to land the plane here. Why are we worshiping and praising God? when nothing's happened yet. Think about this for a minute. We're giving God glory and we're worshiping Him and nothing's happened yet. Remember what I taught you about the past tense and the future tense? I want you to see this. Have you ever thought about praising God in advance? Because it's already done. Man, I'm telling you, this stuff is powerful. This stuff works. He, they begin to worship God. God says, hey, listen, the battle belongs to me. It's not yours. Did you know that this, this text in the Old Testament is the exact middle? Some of you won't get anything else out of this message but this. This is the exact middle of the Old Testament. It's almost like God is saying, I know you're going to struggle and you're going to war and you're going to fight. And I want you to know the exact middle of the old testament is this the battle belongs to me it belongs to me it belongs to the lord he says look at this i'm going to make an old testament sandwich for you and i'm going to give you the meat where's the beef the beef is here the battle come on church belongs to the lord not you not me You might be here this morning and say, Pastor, I've let God down. You haven't let God down? You aren't holding them up. (laughs) Well, I'm trying, and I'm just trying harder, and it just doesn't seem to work. Listen, listen, He wants to work. He wants to work. You say, well, maybe I could just put my hands on something more. Maybe I could do more. Maybe Maybe I could just impress Him more. Maybe I can give him more of what he's expecting of me. He isn't expecting anything of you but for you to trust him. And for him to show up in his power. You ever sit in your house and get a little bit weird like me and watch what flies do? You never do this because you're not a weirdo like me. But have you ever watched how dumb flies are? Listen, I love that. The only thing I love about winter is no mosquitoes and flies. I cannot stand those kind of buggies. But a fly will buzz around exasperating itself, hitting a window, hitting a window, hitting a window, hitting a window. And I just sit there, I'm like, you're dumb. You deserve to die on that window seal because that's where they'll end up. Because you're dumb. Ten feet away is the door. It's screen door, it's wide open. You could fly right out, but you're going to keep hitting the window, keep hitting the window keep hitting the window and that fly's just saying if i could just try harder i'll get through if i could just keep doing if i just keep it up someday no someday you'll be dead laying at the bottom of that window seal and you'll see some big guy like me come along with a vacuum cleaner and go that'll be the end of your existence or (laughs) one time we were uh our last church uh one time a couple of birds got in the sanctuary couple of birds and the sanctuary was pretty high ceiling was i don't know what baby like 30 feet up how many of you know you're not going to get those birds right but my son went in there half my staff in there we're in there with brooms and stuff we got scaffolding we're gonna try to get these birds out of there right and these birds are just like you're stupid (laughs) you're stupid they're gonna fly and do what they want and they did what they want they dropped a few presents on our heads and we didn't get them out and my worship leader, he came up, Nate, I love this guy. Nate comes up and goes, hey, 
What do you think about just opening the doors and letting them? <laughs> what do you think about that? Now, you've got to know Nate because he's like that. He would, ride his, he would ride his tractor to the office every day. I mean, that's Nate. He'd say, hey, 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 what do you think about just opening up them door back there? And them birds would fly right on out. I said, no. No, they're not going to just fly right out. Four hours later, we let them fly right out. Right? You know why you're so tired and exhausted? You're fighting your spouse. You're fighting your kids. You're fighting your parents. You're fighting, you're fighting the police officer. That's why you got the ticket. You're fighting your pastor. You're fighting downtown. You're fighting uptown. You're fighting your neighbors. And God says, the battle is mine. Chasing birds. And getting pooped on. You're a fly just running into the window. Thinking that if you just do a little more, it's all going to change. It's not how it works with God. The end of the story is really, really cool. Because as they begin to worship the Lord, God tells them to do something pretty neat. He says, take up that position, stand strong. The enemy's coming against them. God says in verse 17, you won't need to fight this battle. Just take that position and stand strong. Then watch and wait. Mm -hmm. And you will see, you will see the Lord deliver you. Hallelujah. They don't deliver themselves. God delivers them. You see, you can give up being the general manager of the universe. It's not up to you. It is not up to you. You're not Atlas holding up the whole world. I'll let, you, I'll let you in on a little something. When you leave this world, there'll be someone else. I don't even pastor that way. There'll be somebody after me. It's the Lord that, come on. It's not up to me. It's up to the Lord. I'm just the cup, the container. He's the water. You know, I, I don't do anything but just be his servant and be where I'm supposed to be so that he can show up. That's it. And God does show up. He shows up strong. At the end of the story, i got to close, so I'll just bring you to the end of the story. At the end of the story, the enemy starts fighting themselves. You know, I don't see this today like we should. You see, we think we've got to fight a battle that God's going to, God's going to win by causing the enemy to fight himself. You see, I see the church fighting itself. I see church folk fighting other church folk. I don't see the church very often coming together in prayer and letting God, trusting God, and letting God turn things around, and then the enemy destroys himself. Ooh, that's good. That's good. We used to play this game when we were kids. If somebody fell asleep, We'd grab their hand and say, you're hitting yourself, you're hitting yourself, you're hitting yourself. You never tortured your brother or sister that way, but I did. God says, just back off. And I'll, the enemy hit himself. And, and, then, and then, here's what's really cool. God says, hey, I, get you, I want you to get your worship team together. And I, I want the worship team to go out in front. They're the tip of the spear now. Okay? I want them to go out in front. And, and I want you to go ahead and praise me. And as they go out in front, now think about this. You wouldn't want to be on the worship team right now. Because, what, I got a flute? They got a sword and a big spear. And I'm going to go out. I'm a flautist, you know. You better tell me what you're doing, God. Because this flute, come on. Sometimes I read the Bible and I'm like, that's ridiculous. It's like the Civil War, you know, those drummer boys going, dun, 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 dun. oh, you know. You don't have anything. He says, put the worshipers up. Because, watch, it's, it's a principle. God is saying, listen, praise me in advance. It's a, it's a principle to live by. Praise me in advance. That's when the enemy started fighting. They got out in front, and the enemy fought themselves. They rename this valley. They rename it. It's no longer burden. It's no longer battle. It's not a valley of anything other than, watch this, Barak. At the end of the story, they name it, but it takes them three days to get all the spoil. Now, they're, they're, the Old Testament and New Testament is replete with stories like this. 
where the people of God just stand, trust him, praise him in advance by faith, God wins the battle, and then they clean up. Three days to get the spoil. But the really cool thing is at the end of the story, I probably need to read it, it's in, it's in verse 29. When the nations surrounding Israel heard how God had fought and defeated the enemies of his people, those nations now were afraid to attack. So Jehoshaphat enjoyed peace and security for the rest of his reign as king. The lost saw. The people of the world saw. It was a witness. Your valley, that battle that belongs to God, it's a testimony and a witness to the world. People are looking and watching you and they're watching what you're going through and they're seeing that there's no way you could have done this on your own. You don't think there's people that got a yearbook with my face in it and are still going, what? That guy? It's a testimony to the world of the greatness and the goodness and the power of your mighty God. Give him praise. You know, we all, we all struggle, man. We all struggle. That's okay. Just because you're in a struggle don't mean you've sinned. In fact, a lot of times, the reason why you're in the middle of a struggle is because you did something right. Sometimes you, you think, well, why, why is everybody always picking on me? You know, why, why is things always going so wrong? And you think, well, maybe I blew it somewhere. Not always. Sometimes it's because you were doing what you're supposed to do. And the enemy sees that. And he says, man, get them, boys. And if you're not careful, you'll say, well, bring it on. You'll go all Rambo with, with the devil you know, and God says, would you just let me fight? I'm really good at it. Would you just trust me? Now, I want to I want to know if, if, if I can trust you right now. I mean this right now. I'm going to ask my my brother, Mark Holcomb, to come up. He's going to he's going to give us a time. Uh, he's going to lead us in a time of prayer. Hey, give him a hand. He's good. He's a good man, man of God. Hey, dude, I, I noticed your son's Le- Levi's here today. Yeah, he is. He, awesome, man. How many of you know, there's, there's a little Levi right there. Hi, Levi. Oh, baby Levi, we love you. You got a little, is that like a little bear outfit or something? Man, that's cool. That's cool. It's got little ears on the top and everything. That's awesome. Well, listen, we're going we're gonna to pray today. He's going to lead us. But I wonder if you would burn a couple calories. And you'd be willing to maybe move up a little bit closer. Maybe find a spot up here in front or around the altar and pray with someone else. Just like Joel, bless them, Lord. Give them a breakthrough, God. Give them, Lord, the battle belongs to you. Whatever it is anybody else is doing. I wonder if you would not leave this place today without putting into action.